For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepard. Marcus Buckingham hit the bestseller list in 1999 with First Break All the Rules. Since then, he's written several subsequent books, given countless keynote addresses, appeared on major TV shows like Oprah and The Today Show, and started the Marcus Buckingham Company. Now comes his latest book titled Stand Out, also available as an audiobook from Oasis. Marcus, thanks for your time today. Not at all. Happy to be here. I want to talk about Stand Out, but first, I want to hear a little bit about your story. What's your background and experience that has given you the insight and the business wisdom that you share with others? Well, I was studying psychology, actually social psychology, at Cambridge University in the mid-'80s. And at that time, the study of psychology was the study of pathology. It was the study of what was wrong with people. So you studied depression and psychosis and neurosis. Mm -hmm. And then I met a chap by the name of Donald O. Clifton, who was the chairman of the Gallup organization. And I discovered that there was a company in America. Uh, I know Gallup is known for the poll, but actually uh, a very small part of Gallup was polling. Most of it was spent measuring things that are hard to measure, things like employee engagement or the strength of a customer's relationship to a brand or, in the case of the part of the company I joined, the talent of a person. So I was fascinated to discover that there was this whole field of applied psychology where you could study people that were really, really good at something and then see whether or not they had any talents in common and then actually build interviews with questions and listen fors that could help you measure before you hired somebody whether or not they shared the same talent as the people who'd excelled on the job. So there was this whole focus on excellence, focus on people who were doing things well in the field of applied psychology that I was immediately fascinated by. And so I joined Gallup in 1985, sorry, 1987, as um, a researcher studying what great managers do differently. Many clients would come to Gallup and say, could you, could you see whether or not our great managers have anything in common? Could you find more like them? And so over the years, we did many hundreds of thousands of interviews of great managers, which subsequently, I mean, it was being done originally to build these pre-employment interviews. But of course, when you talk to that many great managers, you do see certain patterns emerging, certain things that they have in common, certain approaches they share. And of course, that then became the raw material for the first book that I wrote uh, while I was at Gallup called first break all the rules. Mm -hmm. Boy, that was a groundbreaking book, too, by the way. I mean, many people read that and profited from that. So it really, I mean, it had to be written, didn't it? You couldn't just sit on this information. No, I mean, it was funny. We wrote it originally as a research paper because so many of the books that you would read on managing and leading would, would either be anecdotal, so somebody who was you know, a big-time personality like Donald Trump or something would write a book about his own experience as a leader, which is fine. Um, or you would have books written um, that were they were parables, uh, like the One Minute Manager, which again were good. But there had not really been a systematic research-based study of what do managers who excel at getting the best from people do differently from those managers who don't excel at that. And we had this extraordinary database of these interviews. And so, yeah, it really had to be, it kind of felt like, it had to be written, not just because of the research, but also because the discovery at the core that the world's best managers actually don't try and change people. They don't believe everyone can be anything they want to be. They don't spend most time focusing on fixing people's flaws. Um, a lot of the, I suppose, a lot of the conventional wisdom of management, they were flying directly in the face of, which is why in the end we called it first break all the rules. Yeah. And as I read Stand Out, this latest one, I, I was thinking about how much has changed since you wrote that first book. I mean, it's incredible what's changed in these few short years. Yeah. Well, of course, when initially when we put that out there, the great managers do, they find where, they, they seem to realize that you don't change people after you've hired them. Huh. And that you're dealing with a person with a distinct pattern of personality. And that beyond that, strangely, although people don't change, the place in which they will change and learn and grow the most is in the areas of their pre-existing strengths. Mm -hmm. So counterintuitively, and against the language that we use, your strengths are in fact your quote-unquote areas of opportunity or areas for development. 
Um, when we first said that, it, it certainly flew in the face of conventional wisdom. Now, you fast forward 12 years, and now there's a whole new branch of psychology called positive psychology, which is dedicated entirely to the study of strengths mm -hmm. and well-being and, 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 and joy and meaning in life. And in fact, the most popular class at Harvard in the entire curriculum at Harvard on any subject is a class that's called an introduction to positive psychology. So yes, things have changed really very dramatically in the last 10 years. And I like to think that that first book and indeed Now Discover Your Strengths, which came afterwards and which launched the Strengths Finder program, mm -hmm. I'd like to think that we had something to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of strengths, I like your example that if a student comes home with a report card that says A, A, B, C, F, we concentrate on the F and we don't praise the A's. Yeah, and it's not just that we don't praise the A's, we don't study the A's. Mm. We focus on the F because we're frightened of the F. And as parents, we automatically want our child to succeed. So we look at the A and we go, well, they're fine there. And then we look at the F or the C or the D or whatever the grade is, and we go, oops, now, what should we, what should we do to fix that? We've got to change that right away, don't we? <laughs> absolutely. Save the child from, <laughs> yeah. from not being perfect child. <laughs> and this, you know, this continues in the workplace, though, where you, you get your, your first performance appraisal, and it's two minutes on what you did well last year and 58 minutes on those areas for development, yeah. which is just a euphemism for the, for the Cs and the Fs, as it were. Hmm. So we have, it starts in childhood and it continues on all the way through our working world. Now things, you know, as you said before, things are changing. But still, when you look within most companies, managers will tend to gloss over your strengths. And almost with the, you know, with the best intentions in the world, they will dive into those areas that they think need to be fixed about you so that you can become perfect. Well, it's self-perpetuating. I mean, that's what they feel like they're expected to do, and so they do it. Absolutely. And perhaps also in the areas where the person who the manager has strengths, the employee doesn't have strengths. So as a manager, you feel you want to be useful. So you, you look at a person perhaps who's very, very organized, but isn't very good at presenting. And you look at the area of organization and you go, well, I can't help them much there. They're already pretty good over there. They might even be better than me over there in that area of organization. But in the area of presenting, I've actually got some tricks and some techniques I could share with them. So just in order to feel useful, mm -hmm. I kind of I, I share with them the strengths that I have, regardless of whatever strengths my direct report has. Mm -hmm. Before we go any further, those who have purchased either the print version of Standout or this audiobook edition were given a key, and that key gives you access to an online, uh, I guess you would call it, what, a survey, a strength finder? What, what do you call it? Well, the, it, we actually call it a strengths assessment. Okay. And so Standout is the next generation strengths assessment that measures you on nine strengths roles and pinpoints your top two. And our focus in doing that was to say, let's try and pinpoint for you, where is your edge? Where is your comparative advantage that you have over everybody else? It won't necessarily say that you should do one position or another or play, do one job versus another. It simply will say that whatever position you're in, those top two strengths roles will be your comparative advantage. So it, it will help you know what kind of a manager you will be, what kind of a salesperson you will be, what kind of a service professional you will be. So our focus was to try and put you back together and say, what is your cutting edge? And then in the results themselves, feed you only those innovations or ideas or tips or techniques that fit your particular strengths roles. So that we don't give you ideas and techniques that are inauthentic and look silly when you try them, but that are, uh, that are in fact techniques that fit the particular strength roles that the assessment has revealed that you have. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, give you ideas that fit you. Yeah. Are people surprised when they take this? And by the way, uh, they really should take the time to use that key and go online and take this strength assessment because it, it really will make the book far more valuable. But are people sometimes surprised? I mean, I have yet to do this. Uh, I have the key and I haven't used it yet. And I didn't want to use it until after we talked. But I wonder if I'll be surprised. I think I'm probably a connector primarily. Uh, maybe a, a creator, 
but do you think I'll be surprised when I take the assessment? Well, you may well be, because the previous strengths assessments that I've been a part of building, the, the most notable, of course, of which was, was Strength Finder that we launched 10 years ago, actually, this year. The point of Strength Finder was to, was to ask you to rate yourself on a list of qualities or attributes. Uh, and so the summary of that research, that assessment, was a summary of, of how you see yourself on these attributes. Are you a coach or are you a teacher? Do you like to hang out with historians? Do you like to hang out with futurists? So the summary of that was really a summary of how you see yourself. And so many people, when they were done with that assessment, weren't that surprised by the results because, frankly, you'd gone through the assessment and told it how you see yourself. This new uh, generation of strengths assessment called Standout is, is designed very differently. It doesn't ask you to rate yourself on a list of traits or attributes. It's called a situational judgment test. And so it, it gives you a situation and then says, what would you do? And then it gives you another situation and says, what would you do? And again and again, what would you do? What would you do? And it puts you on a timer so you can't really intellectualize <laughs> what you would do. It just says, hey, 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 what would you do? Mm -hmm. And the, the scenarios are very carefully crafted, so there are trigger words in each one. So even if you look at all four of the options and you go, well, I don't think I'd do any, there's still one that will pull you slightly more than another, and that will be revealing. So for each of those nine strengths roles, we give you actually 12 different chances to, to pick um, that you would actually behave in that way. We give you 12 different opportunities to choose. And in the end, the summary, therefore, is a summary of what you would do, which means that although your results may not be how you would see yourself, they are actually a reflection of how other people see you. Mm. They are how you come across to others. So you may well be surprised when you get it back. And I guess I would ask you, as I would ask any listener or reader, at least when you get your results, at least keep your mind open to the fact that those two top strengths roles are how other people perceive you when you sit down across the table from them or when you walk into a meeting with them or when you have a conversation with them, that this is how you are coming across. Very this is interesting. how you're being felt. Yeah, I find that fascinating, and I, I can't wait to do this. I really can't. Uh, the nine strengths are advisor, connector, creator, equalizer, influencer, pioneer, provider, stimulator, teacher. We're not going to rewrite the book or tell the whole book here, but you say that of the nine, that people typically have two that are strongest? Yes, well, that's what we decided to pinpoint, uh, because you can't... Uh, our focus here was, when you come into a room, when I walk into a room, whether I know it or not, uh, there is a certain um, impact that I have on the people in that room. There are certain default behaviors that I resort to, certain recurring patterns of behavior. And I can either wield those accidentally, I can either walk into a room and not really be aware of how I'm coming across, even though I'm coming across that way, or I can use them deliberately, or I can be intentional about how I use them. So in terms of the results of this assessment, what we wanted to give people is enough information that they could remember it um, so that they could then use that information intentionally. That's why we decided to only give you your top two, because frankly, you start giving people three, four, five, six, seven. You can't absorb it, can you? Uh, you can't. And you go, well, I want, yes, but I want to see the full range of what my personality is. All right, well then you should probably take a different strengths assessment like Strength Finder, which will try and describe your style. We're not really interested in describing your style. We want to pinpoint where you have an edge and get you to remember it so that you can apply it intentionally. You can't apply it intentionally if you can't remember it. So let's give you two, your top two strengths roles, and then make sure that we give you enough information to really dive into that so that you can think through in the next meeting that you have, or the next presentation that you have, or the next colleague you're interacting with, that you know how that you can deliberately apply those strengths at work. Yeah, that's what I like about Stand Out. You, you do drill down on each one of these. So in, in, in my case, when, I, when my top two are identified, I'm not left wondering what I do in situations where I can apply those. You, you give me specific advice on how to best make the most of those strengths. Yes. Well, we've, we've decided that we wanted to make this 
if my previous strengths assessments were descriptive of your style, we wanted this, to, this one to be very prescriptive. Hmm. What should you go do? So we will say, with your top two, mine happened to be connector, creator. You put mine, to, sorry, uh, mine happened to be creator, stimulator. You put those two together, creator, stimulator. You get somebody who's an enthusiast, who tries to bring energy and enthusiasm to ideas, to concepts, to plans. That's, that's kind of what I do, whether it's in books or whether it's in presentations or whether it's leading my team. That's kind of what I do. Beyond that, what I need to know are things like, well, what careers would fit that best? I'd want to know, if I'm joining a new team, what's a way for me to make an immediate impact? Yeah. If I wanted to take my performance to the next level, what might I do to actually take those top two strengths roles, refine them and sharpen them and make them more valuable? What are the pitfalls that I should avoid? Mm -hmm. Or if I'm going to be a leader, what kind of techniques or tactics work for leaders who share the connector stimulator strengths roles? Because I don't want to be given techniques for leaders that fit some other kind of strength roles, because then I'll look stupid <laughs> and inauthentic when I try to use them. So that's why in the book we've given as many detailed practical things as we could find so that you can go, all right, well, that, now that I know I'm a creator stimulator, at least you can feed me uh, practical techniques to go and apply that. Now, yeah. some of them you may go, ah, that doesn't quite fit me. Then that's fine. But as much as we can, we wanted to give you a nice, robust, practical list of things that you can go try so that you can win at work. I love how you've organized it. You've made it very easy to get a handle on and to really uh, uh, do us the most good, to put it bluntly. And I, I really appreciate the way you've done that. Any other advice for the person who's just beginning to pick this up and to listen to the audiobook or read the print edition? Well, I think the, the most salient advice for anybody on this is to remember that the things that come so naturally to you, you get so close to that you don't see them anymore. Hmm. And that one of the purposes of this book and this assessment is to give you a little distance from yourself so that you can see that those things that come so easily to you, they're almost like breathing, are in fact the very things that will help you make the greatest contribution to your team or to your family or to your company. Just because something is natural for you uh, doesn't mean it's not valuable. In fact, the opposite's true. The things that come most naturally to you are the things that are most valuable about you. And you can use them for ill. I mean, you can misdirect them. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're an influencer, let's say, or a creator or a stimulator, it doesn't mean you're using it productively. It could lead you into all sorts of inappropriate behaviors. The point on something like this is to go, wait a minute, you do have certain ways of behaving. Let's identify what those are. Let's name them so that you can then figure out how to use them as productively as possible. And let's give you as many ideas around that as we possibly can. The, I think there are so many of us who take ourselves for granted because we listen to the noisy clamor of the world outside us, a manager who says, you should do this, or even a well-intended mentor who says, well, you should be like me. So if you think about it, if you were an engineer, you would say that when it comes to your strengths, the signal to noise ratio is terrible. So I think the whole point of standout is to turn up the signal, to turn up the signal of your strengths so that despite the noise of all those people around you saying, do this, try that, you should be like this, you can turn down that noise and turn up the signal of your strengths and therefore end up, hopefully, living a first-rate version of your life as opposed to a second-rate version of somebody else's. I appreciate your time today, Marcus. I feel like you've given us a mini-seminar here, <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Not at all. I've enjoyed it. I hope, uh, hope all the readers enjoy the audio book and, the, and take the assessment and hope they can find a way to put that to work. Let me give the website for your company. It's the acronym, the Marcus Buckingham Company, tmbc.com, tmbc.com. And for the strength assessment, you have the key on this audio book. You go to standout.tmbc.com. Marcus Buckingham, the author of Standout. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much. For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd.